I can see lots of positives about football at this point in time, particularly the growth of the game amongst girls and women. It's an area that lots of nations, not just within UEFA, but across FIFA, across the world, have prioritised. And I think that's very encouraging that we're reaching out to countries that perhaps hadn't really had any infrastructure for developing the game for both sexes. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it, that you know we've, we've laboured on with the game being so dominated by um, boys and men. But um, unfortunately, that's a truth. But what it does uh, do is give a lot of headroom for growing the game amongst girls and women. So that's a positive. I'm afraid I'm less optimistic about the men's game, certainly at professional, senior professional level, mainly because I think there's been a polarisation of some of the very top clubs, uh, and that was exemplified in the um, proposed breakaway European Super League. But I think that kind of disconnect between the top professional men's clubs and the rest of the game has become ever more pronounced, and that worries me. Um, for a whole host of reasons, but I but I do think there's still cause for great optimism because in many respects football is the simplest game that anyone can play in any sport anywhere across the planet. It's a game that could be played in a small village in Africa or in an urban city in the Americas. So you know, in some respects, we've got the asset of having simplicity and global appeal, historic global appeal. So if you put all of that together, I think there's more reasons to be optimistic than pessimistic. Well, you started your answer saying you're less optimistic about the men's game. Uh, is that down to the uh, race for cash uh, and the beautiful game losing a little bit of its luster uh, in this race for profits by the billionaire owners? I think there's a lot in that question, <laughs> Stephen, to be honest. I mean, you know, we, we know that it would be naive to suggest we can roll back from where football is now as a, as a global sport. But I think its ownership and its governance can certainly be improved and improved in a way that would benefit the game and benefit all of the people involved in the game, the so-called stakeholders, to use the jargon of these things. But, you know, it's back to my point about the appeal and the profile and the reach of football. I mean, every child um, could potentially be hooked by the game. The reason they're not is because the opportunities to have fun through the game are probably not sufficiently developed. And I do think, actually, the relationship between the grassroots of the game and what you've described as being greed or avarice amongst owners of the top clubs is connected. Because if you take your eye off the ball, excuse the pun, but if you take your eye off the, the football and start thinking purely about elite success and not really investing in the grassroots, whether that's the community game in you know, if you take a, a big club like Manchester United or Real Madrid or uh, Paris Saint-Germain, you know, if there isn't a, a, a base or foundation of success amongst young children playing the game, we're not going to recruit our next Ronaldo or our next Gareth Bale or our, our next Mbappe. And I think we have to have those conversations. You know, we can't allow the very top clubs to depart too far from what we would call the football pyramid because it's, it's a principle of solidarity, it's a principle of investment, and it's a way of ensuring that the game not only survives, but, but flourishes and develops further and reaches out more. The next big issue, uh, Laura, is next year's World Cup in Qatar. It's attracted, the decision to go to Qatar, attracted controversy right from the beginning, and it'll have a massive impact on the European game as it's happening in December for the first time. It is do you think a World Cup in Qatar a good idea? My instinctive answer to that is that it's fraught with difficulties. But but you know let's let's not make any you know great claims here before the event. It seems to me that the decision was made to take the World Cup to Qatar. We have to now see whether that can be done in a safe and sustainable and um, let's be honest, equality driven way, so that the game's image is not um, damaged. But, you know, let's be fair, there were... I think you're being optimistic in... about an equality way, to be honest. Well, I mean, I, I'm not being optimistic or pessimistic because I'm asking the question rather than giving the answer. You know, I think equality is a fundamental principle of, of football, certainly in Europe. And you, you look at the UEFA values and equality is right at the very heart of it, respect and equality. So I think it does challenge us, really, to make sure that we don't lose sight of our values in the game. Um, but, you know, my point was going to be as well, there were similar misgivings over handing the World Cup to Russia on a similar basis in some regards back in 
2018. And I think we do need to revisit some of the criteria by which major tournaments are allocated. Um, maybe it's about a grading and making sure that, you know, financial advantage and resource put in isn't the driving force alone, that we are mindful of the values and the ethics of the game, and that we want to make sure that the game will be open not only to all players, but to all fans as well. So that's not being naive, because I understand exactly what the political and cultural difficulties are in holding a World Cup in Qatar. But we are where we are. And now I think whatever happens next year, next winter, um, we'll need to really re revisit this and make sure that it is um, a tournament that continues to reflect all that's good about the game, um, rather than undermine some of its fundamental principles. And lastly, uh, Laura, uh, how close uh, is Wales to winning Euro 2020? <laughs> oh, that's a nice thought, isn't it? Yeah, as we prepare for our first game on Saturday against Switzerland. Look, you know, I, I was out in um, in France for Euro 2016, and you know, let's remember Wales did better than any of the home nations in that tournament, reaching the semi-finals. But it's going to be a big ask. Laura McAllister, former professional footballer, many thanks to you for joining us on the agenda. Thank you.